Hello and welcome everybody to another installment of Christian Talks About Classical Mythology. I hope you're ready because we have one of the great tricksters coming up, Hermes. So we've been looking at the Homeric hymns and I've already discussed the Homeric hymn to Demeter. So if you've watched that, you can jump ahead because the first part of this video is also going to go over the basics of the Homeric hymn. But if you have not, Welcome to the Homeric Hymn to Hermes. We're going to be using a translation by Daryl Hine, and I am Dr. Christian Lehman. So let's go over just the basics of what is a Homeric Hymn. Well, it's a collection of 33 poems that mostly praise the Olympian pantheon. So we spent some time with Hesiod's Theogony and Works and Days, and the Theogony in particular talk about the rise of Zeus and the other Olympians to a hegemonic position on Mount Olympus. Those gods then gain a, many, a lot of different hymns. And it's really interesting to compare the way in which those gods are presented in the hymns versus in the Theogony and the works and days, as it will be interesting to trace their treatment over the next uh, text that we read. The name Homeric comes from Homer, the author, the ascribed author of the Iliad and the Odyssey, but this is, these are texts are certainly not by Homer because Homer never existed. It's a conflation. It's a term that's given to these poems that were produced over generations and hundreds of years by a number of different uh, composers and poets before finally being ascribed to a Homer. Um, the reason though that they use Homeric is because of the poetic meter in which the Greek is written. So a meter called the dactylic hexameter. Um, Hesiod also wrote in this, so I don't call them the Hesiodic hymns, but Homeric has that aura of authority. Um, and that's the meter that they were originally composed and sung in. These would have been sung for hundreds of years before they were written down in the same way. And this is the nature of oral poetry transitioning to written textual poetry. These hymns provide origin stories and myths, spheres of influence, epithets, etc. And just because Today, we read them largely for those mythy qualities. Um, I don't want us to focus too much on that because they also are important for um, a religious purpose, right? We shouldn't think that nobody ever didn't treat these texts religiously. A key word for our discussion is going to be etiology. Etiology is when myth explains something that we experience or we have in daily life. And the Homeric hymn to Hermes, in particular, is going to be full of these. But the hymn to Demeter, we saw it a couple of times, right? We saw the creation of the cult of Demeter, and we saw the um, idea of why we have winter, spring, fall, and summer. However, most importantly, Homeric hymns are about negotiations of power. In the Theogony, we watch the generation of Uranos give way to Kronos, give way to Zeus. We talk continually about how did Zeus gain that power, gain that hegemony over Olympus. Now though, we get to watch the gods, the Olympian gods negotiate for their own power, their own spheres of influence. And in Demeter, we saw kind of a form of blackmail in order for Demeter to get what she wants, she made the earth barren so that no gods received sacrifice because there was nothing to sacrifice. The hymn to Hermes looks a lot more like a courtroom drama. And so it will be exciting to explore some of that over the next few minutes. So the hymn to Hermes opens with what we should now be accustomed to seeing, an invocation of a muse. Muse. Sing a hymn about Hermes, the infant son of Zeus and of Maya, governor over Kylene and pastoral Arcady also. Light-fingered messenger of the immortals, whom Maya gave birth to, bashful and lovely-haired nymph, who had mingled in liking with great Zeus. That means to have sex. Shunning the company of all the blessed, she inhabited some deep shadowy cavern where Zeus in the dead of night would consort to mingle his substance with that of the lovely haired nymph when he thought that pleasant repose overwhelmed white armed Hera, his sister and wife, 
thus fooling the undying gods, fooling men who are born to perish. So already here we have this idea of power and unequal qualities of that power, right? Because Zeus here, he's consorting, and that's an awkward word, right? He's going down and he's having sex with this woman. We don't really have a sense of consensual or non-consensual. But notice what he's doing. He's cheating on Hera, right? Because he thinks that Hera is asleep, and so he runs off to have sex with another woman. As a result of this sex, um, Maya, that's the she in the next sentence, then she gave birth to a baby, devious, wily, a robber, a rustler of cattle, a dream guide. Yes, the conductor of dreams, and a spy in the night, and a lookout, skulking at other men's doors, who was presently going to show off glorious deeds and notorious doings among the immortals. Born in the morning, by noon he was playing the zither. By nightfall, he had abducted the cattle belonging to the marksman Apollo. Zither is a very unfortunate translation of liar. And we'll talk about that in a second. This translation, the translator moves back and forth between those two terms. There are different words, though, and different instruments. So it is unfortunate that we have that. Um, but notice, uh, we're getting the plot structure, right? The person saying, here's what you're going to read about. You're going to read about the birth. You're going to read about him playing the liar. And then you're going to read about the abduction of the cattle. And what this uh, hymn is going to do is retell those elements. And they'll be very uh, important as the progress goes. So we jump into it almost immediately with an etiology of the liar. So here on the right hand side of the screen is a base painting image of a tortoise shell liar. So you can see how it's structured. The, the, the tortoise shell forms the echoing chamber of the body of the lyre, and then you string it with guts and you can use horn or wood to make the rest of the apparatus. So baby Hermes leaves the house and as he was passing over the threshold before the high ceiling cave, he discovered a tortoise. Notice that we're at a threshold. It's always interesting to be at thresholds, right? Liminal spaces from which he derived much delight. For Hermes it was who originally made the tortoise a singer. She first encountered her maker in front of the gate of the forecourt, where she was browsing upon the luxuriant grass at the house front, swaying along on all four feet. Right? This is very innocent image. She has a tortoise minding her own business. How the light-fingered grandson of Cronus, that's Hermes, right? I'm getting some epithets here with the light-fingered and we get the patronymic son of, grandson of Cronus. How he laughed when he noticed the tortoise immediately saying as follows, omen to me, so propitious already, I shall not despise you. Greetings, my graceful, desirable chorister, banquet companion, welcome, well-met apparition. Now, where did you get that fine play thing? I mean, your colorful shell, you, a tortoise that lives in the mountains, picking you up, I will carry you into the house. You will be of use to me, yet I intend no dishonor. But first you shall serve me. Better to be in the house, out of doors. It is dangerous for you. You shall be during your life a defense against mischievous magic. And if you happen to die, you will sing very beautifully after. When he had spoken in both of his hands, he immediately lifted up the adorable plaything and carried it into the house where, flipping it onto its back, he began with a knife of gray iron neatly to scrape out the vitals of that mountain frequenting tortoise. This is abrupt. He goes from praise, 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 praise to just slaughtering the tortoise to get rid of its innards. This is in some ways um, an instance of seeing a god interact with nature. Nature is um, deployable for gods. It's secondary to the gods. Well, he then builds his lyre and when he had completed its structure, he took the desirable plaything, tuning it first with a plectrum. A plectrum is like a, a musical pick that you have, like if you play the guitar. It gave forth wonderful music under his touch. Then the god very beautifully sang to his own sweet improvisation, like boys, adolescents on festive occasions, bandying sly innuendo. He sang about Zeus, son of Kronos, and about Maya, the prettily sandaled, and how they consorted once in the friendship of love. He told of his proper conception and of his honorable name, and he spelled that out in some detail. Next, celebrating the servants and glorious home of the nymphs. Uh, so this is hysterical. Right? It's also what we call, and let me make a different color for this. 
meta poetic. Metapoetic moments are when in poetry or in literature, there's a discussion of the creation of poetry or literature. And so here, it should be very clear to you what he's doing. He is hymning. But he's hymning himself. It's kind of this amazing egoism. So the overarching structure is that there's a poet singing about Hermes. And then inside that poem sung to Hermes, Hermes sings a poem to himself. It's really a marvelous moment because Hermes has simultaneously invented the lyre, and then with that, he invents the hymn. Of course, we are aware, we in the audience, that this is anachronistic, because look at that simile that we get. We get, he's doing it like boys on the festive occasions. Those festive occasions are things that humans have to celebrate the gods. So at the human festivals, they sing these praises to the gods. Here comes his first trick. Pondering, utter deceit in his heart, such as brigands and robbers make their professional care under cover of colorless night. The sun was descending from earth into ocean with horses and car when Hermes arrived at the sun of the shady Pyrian mountains. So this is night, right? Because the sun's descending, so the sun is going down, and so that means it's nighttime. And notice he's being compared to robbers and thieves. At this place, were the ambrosial cattle belonging to blessed immortals kept to their buyers and pastured in upon the unmown lovely meadows. Unmown is interesting. It means there's no technology that's kept this place. Of these, the infant of Maya, the keen-sided slayer of Argus, cutting off 50 loud bellowing cows from the herd, quickly drove them every which way over the sandy terrain, thus confusing their footprints. And, he remembered another deceitful technique, for he turned their hoof prints around while the front one's behind and the back one's in front while walking the opposite way. So, and then he wove himself wickerwork sandals out of the reeds in the sand of the seashore, a marvelous work not seen before. So this is a three-step cattle trick. The first thing he does is he takes the cows and he mixes the ball up so you can't tell the footprints and how many there are. Then, he turns the hooves of the cows around and has them walk backwards. So this way it's going to look like the cows are moving forwards when he um, moves them away. So and it's not a great trick. It's a little bit clever, but it's not a great trick. And it's not, like, not going like, to create huge confusion. But he also invents these big sandals. And that's a particularly interesting moment um, that he does. Because it's like another, like, it's like, why do we have this footwear? Oh, well, Hermes was just like, oh, look, cool. Look at these reeds. I'm going to weave them together. At the same time, he invents kindled fire, or a little bit later. So you'll, this is a difficult concept, right? Because we've already had Hermes bring fire to humans. So humans have fire, but they don't necessarily have control of fire. So by inventing the way to kindle it, we have another form of like Hermes now playing a role with the invention of technology, because fire is this fundamental point of inventing technology. As we talked about with the idea of iron, iron needed smelting. So he, he collected a heap of dry wood, kindling and logs, and invented the science of fire. Taking a glistening, and now we have an interesting word, right? So the word here is faggot, but this is not the gay slur, okay? This just means a bundle of dried sticks. It later gets taken on to mean the gay slur of laurel. He trimmed it with iron, fitted it into his palm, and the hot breath of fire was awakened. Hermes thus, first of all, furnished the trappings of fire and fire into a deeply dug trench. He put plenty of beautifully kindling, dry and abundant and thick. From far away, the conspicuous flame flashed. So, good job, Hermes. Why is fire good? Because with fire, you can roast meat. And all of this is kind of driven because uh, Hermes has this insatiable desire to eat meat when he wakes up. So, throwing them, the cattle, down on the ground on their backs and then rolling them over, when he had pulled them about and they lay out of breath, he transfixed their vitals, their innards. Performing one text, task, then another, he cut off the fatty, rich meat, roasting it, spit it on sticks, cut of wood altogether, flesh and the parts of the carcass reserved for the gods and the black blood, wrapped in the entrails as sausage. The rest he left lying in situ. So here he goes, he invents sausage. And uh, in doing so, it's really interesting. He's mimicking the trick of uh, Prometheus, 
but he's also taking the, like, the really good stuff and making it delicious for him. So it's this cool bit where we're replaying, and actually let me write this down, we are replaying a Kone. Um, he then tries to go home, right? Because he's been like shenaniganing all night. So swiftly advancing on tiptoe, the floor did not bring to his footfall. Quickly, he crept to his wickerwork cradle. Respectable Hermes. Pulling the swaddling bands over his shoulders, he lay like an infant. <laughs> Newborn, playfully feeling the blanket that bunched around his knees, but keeping his darling, the tortoise shell, well within reach on his right side. Nor was his mother, the goddess, deceived by the guide, and she said so. What is the meaning of? Where have you been at this hour of night, eh? Right, so it says, you come to home too late, you promise, like, oh, I'll be home at this time, and then your parents or guardians are like, you said you'd be home, and you're not. We have the first disappointed parents of literature of, that comes from the Greek tradition. Hermes returned to his mother, a cunning worded reply. Dear mother, how can you upbraid? Scold, how can you upbraid me as if I were only a newborn baby that knows precious little? At my age of evil affections, trembling, fearful of nothing so much as a parent's reproach. I shall embrace a profession Whichever is best to provide us, you and myself, with a living, infallibly keep us in clover. Ma, I'm gonna be a lawyer, a doctor. It's amazing, right? Like, he's a, he's a little douchebag kid. Uh, but Apollo notices that somebody has stolen his cattle and he goes tracking them down. He pretty much finds these uh, weird footprints that he's never seen before. When he examined the footprints, the dealer of death from afar, that's Apollo, and notice his epithet, dealer of death from afar, that's because he is an archer. So you shoot arrows, so death comes from afar. Said, goodness, but this is a miracle which I behold with my eyes. Here are the hoofprints quite clearly belonging to cattle with straight horns, strangely reversed, so they're pointed again to the Asphodel Meadow. Yet, these are never the footprints belonging to a man or a woman. No more to gray-coated wolves or to bears, nor the footprints of lions, nor do I think they are anything proper to shaggy maned centaurs. Who can it be that advancing on ravenous feet makes such monstrous tracks on the side of the road pretty queer, and much worse on the other? So there's the like, effect of the, the funny big shoes that Hermes invented, but it reminds me really keenly of Calvin and Hobbes. Here's two moments um, out of three that I know of where Calvin does something similar. So in the top comic here, look what I made, Hobbes. What is it? What is it? Why, it's a huge bird foot. I'm going to press it in the snow and make everyone think a two-ton chickadee walked by. Yes, time weighs more heavily on some people's hands than others. He's just jealous because I accomplish so much more than he does. So here we have the sense of play that we get in the hymn to Hermes. And that's so important. Play is so important and trickery <laughs> in the second comic. What are you doing? And you'll see Calvin is jumping backwards on one leg. Calvin says, I'm throwing people off my trail with deceptive footprints. See, everyone will think these tracks were made by a one-legged kid going that way, and they'll be completely wrong. Who exactly is on your trail? Look, it doesn't hurt to take precautions. So the, between these two, we kind of combine the, the tricks of Hermes. We've recently been talking about classical reception, and I would not say that this is classical reception, right? This is not. But it's fun, comparanda, to think about um, Hermes in the hymn to Hermes being very similar to six year old Calvin. Apollo pretty much figures it out and goes to uh, Hermes and Maya's house to threaten. When he'd, Apollo, when he'd thoroughly pried in the corners, all through the house, with these words, Leto's son, that's Apollo, spoke to Honorable Hermes. Child, lying low in your cradle, immediately show me the cattle. Otherwise, we two shall differ, and hardly according to order. Catching you up, I shall cast you away in Tartarus's murky, dark, ineluctable, horrible doom, from which neither your mother nor father Zeus shall release you, and you may revisit the daylight. Under the earth evermore, you shall wander the captain of we folk. So that's a pretty big threat, right? Like, yikes. Hermes, though, replied to his brother, but cunningly worded his answer. 
What is the meaning of these cruel words, son of Leto, that you utter? Is it in search of your pastoral cattle you pay us this visit? I have not seen them nor learned of them from the report of another. Therefore, I cannot inform you nor win the reward of informers. Do I resemble the rustler of cattle, a muscular he-man? This is no doing of mine. Other matters have preoccupied me hitherto. Sleep was my business. Sleep and the milk of my mother, keeping the bedclothes tucked over my shoulders and tepid ablutions. Let no one learn whence this quarrel arose. It would be a great wonder, even among the immortals, an infant newborn who has passed the courtyard with cows from the field. You are making extravagant charges. I was born yesterday. My feet are sensitive to the uneven earth underfoot. If you wish, I will swear a great oath by my father's head. I insist I am neither myself the responsible party, nor have I seen anybody abducting your reverence cattle. Cattle, whatever that means, for I know them only by hearsay. Right. This should have you in stitches. This is some really, really funny stuff. Definitely the funniest stuff that we've read so far. Um, so first of all, notice he's like, Cattle one, cattle two, cattle. I don't know what that means. I don't even know what we're talking about. What is this conversation? And in between, he's like, oh, I only care about this stuff that babies care about. But then we get this awesome thing. He's like, you know what? I'm not the baby that did this, but if a baby did that, oh my God, that would be amazing. It would be a great wonder, even among the immortals. So. Here's Hermes, playing both sides. Always playing both sides. Double-sided Hermes. Uh, Apollo, though, has no patience for this. When he had spoken, Apollo laid hold of the infant to lift him. Meanwhile, the mighty destroyer of Argus, that's Hermes, considered a bit, and lifted in Phoebus' arms, he let fly an impertinent omen, namely, a loud and presumptuous messenger, surf of the belly following quickly upon which he sneezed. When Apollo heard this, he instantly out of his arms to the ground cast horrible Hermes. So what happens here? We get one of the earliest farts in literature. This, so we just came upon a fart joke. Pretty amazing. You could also run the argument that it's a defecation joke, right? He like, like pooped all over him. I'm partial to that. Um, it seems a little less likely though. Especially because then we have the sneeze, right? So we have this idea of involuntary bodily action but it's also a little bit voluntary. One of the great sneezes of literature, by the way, one of the great sneezes, um, there's a, another pretty remarkable uh, one in some other things. Like whenever the body reacts, it's always interesting, right? So we're gonna get hiccups in Aristophanes when we're reading about love, Eros, later on. Um, here we have a sneeze and we'll have another sneeze or and a laugh in the Odyssey. So bodily functions in literature, bodily functions in literature. Apollo takes Hermes to go to Zeus. So it's like, hey, well, there's a reason we have this big time God because he's going to act as a judge and jury. So both of them are gonna to go to Zeus and present the sides of their story. This is where the courtroom drama really kicks into gear. Came they to their father, the scion of Kronos, omnipotent King Zeus. There was a balance of justice established for both of the disputants. There was a sociable murmur on snow inundated Olympus where the unwithered immortals had gathered not, longer after, not long after sunrise. Hermes and Phoebus Apollo, the silver bowed, stood at the knees of Zeus the high thunderer, who briefly asked of his dazzling firstborn, Phoebus, no, Phoebus, now, where are you coming from, driving this excellent booty, namely, a newly born baby that nonetheless looks like a herald? This, is a serious matter to enter a godly assembly. So they both sides, uh, both sides tell their story. Zeus is like, go settle it on your own. They go to the cows, which um, they discover. And Apollo tries to bind, to handcuff Hermes. Whenever he takes these reeds and wraps them around his wrist, they fall apart. So Hermes keeps escaping and Apollo gets really pissed off. And as he's about to like really unleash, Hermes pulls out his lyre. He tuned it, and under his touch it sounded miraculously. So Phoebus Apollo was moved to delight and to laughter, because the lovable notes of the music, marvelous music, 
went straight to his midriff as he was listening and a sweet yearning laid hold of his senses. And so here we have a sen well, another, we're continuing this idea of the power of music. Power of music. Apollo, killer of cattle, resourceful, laborious feasting companion. What you have improvised easily equals I am worth 50 cattle. Now I suppose our differences will be tranquilly settled. What is this art? This new muse that assuages impossible sorrows? What is this practice? For truly it offers us three things together. Happiness, sexual love, and the pleasures of sleep for the choosing. And here we get a great moment of like, what are the three, what are three uses of music? Well, you turn on a tune and you just can jam. You can lose yourself in the music in the moment. You want it? Um, it just makes you happy. Um, but also, it can make you horny, right? You turn the right song on and it hits the mood and suddenly um, you are feeling like you're ready for sex. So that's a good accompaniment there. That's also connected to this concept of the symposium in ancient Greece, which we'll talk about later, um, to which uh, you have lyres and flute girls that play and accompany. And then also the pleasures of sleep, right? The lullaby. So it's, it's really great, like this, this kind of perfect playlist that we have here, depending on what you want to get out of listening to music. They become reconciled as a result of this gift. And so um, we have um, Hermes talking here. This, this I shall make uh, you a gift of, O glorious son of our father. I shall go pasture our cattle who graze at discretion in grassland. Notice he's like, our cattle. You know, he just kind of like brought him onto himself. On the horse nourishing prairies and meadows high up in the mountains, there when the cows have been put to the bulls, they shall bear in abundance, bull calves and heifers alike. Therefore, little necessity is there, Phoebus, although you're a capitalist to get frightfully angry. When he had finished, he proffered his lyre, which Apollo accepted pledging his glittering whip in exchange for the gift and ordaining Hermes his herdsman. Delighted, the infant of Maya accepted. Leto's all-glorious son, the far guardian lordly Apollo, taking the lyre on his arm with a plectrum accordingly tuned it. Under his touch, it sounded miraculously, and he chanted. Not long thereafter, the cattle returned to their god-given meadow. This is why, so one of the reasons um, most statues, of uh, many statues from antiquity actually show Apollo holding the lyre. And this part of the myth is explaining why we don't see Hermes holding the lyre, because he has traded it off. He's um, given it away in exchange for um, some honors, right? He gets to be the cattle herder, he gets to keep his life, and he is now famous for this trick, right? He gets to have all of the kleos, all of the fame that comes from having gotten away with this. They then continue to make deals for himself, Hermes. He discovered the secret of an alternative science. He fashioned the note of the pan pipes, audible at a great distance. Pan pipes are basically what um, stereotypes of seeing Peter Pan play. That's what, that's what he has. So it's like, oh yeah, I got rid of one instrument, now he has another one. But Phoebus, addressing him then, saying, I am afraid, my dear boy, that a pathfinder and devious, witted, clever as you will make off with both zither and bent bow together. Again, so that's the liar that we have. And now he's afraid, he's like, I think you're probably gonna give my bow away from me. Seeing that, you have a charter from Zeus to establish transactions, trade and exchange among men over all the exceedingly fertile earth. So this is merchants and commerce. So another sphere of influence for Hermes is merchants and commerce. He's in control of those areas. But if you are so bold as to swear the great oath of the gods by nodding your head or upon the all-powerful waters of Styx, then you would do all, to my mind, that is friendly and gives satisfaction. So this is the third time we've seen the river Styx. We saw it, of course, in the Theogony, where it was explained why it's such a powerful oath. Then we saw it in the Demeter, and now we see it again here. Then did the infant of Maya, inclining his hand, undertake that never would he pilfer anything owned by the long distance archer. So the deals have been made. And weirdly, we shift now 
to this notion of prophecy because Apollo needs to reestablish his spheres of influence. You know, he needs to have control of the bow. Now he has the lyre, and then he also doesn't want to give up prophecy. And so, in the same way that at the end of the hymn to Demeter, we had secret knowledge with if you're a worshiper of Demeter. Now we get this idea of secret knowledge related to Apollo. Do not, dear brother, endowed with the scepter of gold, do not ask me ever to utter the secrets our far-sighted father considers. One among men I may abjure, another I'll cover with kindness, leading in circles the multiple tribes of despicable mortals. But he who follows the sound of my voice and the flights of portentous birds to um, tell prophecy by birds is called augury, just for fun, um, and I shall never deceive him. So if you believe in Apollo and follow Apollo, you will get true prophecy. But he who, believing in vainly loquacious and meaningless omens, wants to discover our prophecy contrary to our intention and to know more than the gods who exist for eternity, I say, his is a vain expedition. So again, we're negotiating now for worshipers. The hymn to Demeter says, worship Demeter, get secrets to good life. Apollo says, hang out and give respect to Apollo and you get true prophecy, all right? So in addition to negotiating for power um, among themselves, the gods are also negotiating for power among worshipers. And that is going to be the conclusion to our this very brief discussion of the hymn to Hermes. A last thought that I'd like you to think about, though, is how playful is this? How playful is this? So what I mean by that is, do you think that we are meant to view this hymn as solely a joke or as playful? Are we even supposed to see it as playful? Like, can, is there a way to just take this play very, very seriously? I want you to consider some of these elements. Like, how, how does this hymn read to you? How do you um, absorb it as a, an interpreter? Thank you very much, and uh, go steal some cows. <laughs>